Here we go. So the students who aren't in class, uh, feedback is in your grade book um, for the practice summary. The model is open under that folder so you can compare the model with what I'm saying on your document. All right? And then if you've got questions, um, let me know. Uh, we did not get a chance to finish this one last slide last week, so I'm just going to talk a little bit, well, we, we did it very quickly, so I'm just going to do it in a little bit more um, detail because I think it will help you tie back your um, elements of the summary back to the purpose if you understand this idea a little bit more. Okay, so if it is a quantitative study, so they're collecting data that has numbers attached to it, right, then they, they'll have an, at least one independent variable, they may have more. And the independent variable is the thing that you're manipulating. All right? So if we say, um, do, do uh, sprint athletes get stronger hamstrings doing exercise A or exercise B, then the exercise program would be the independent variable because that's the thing I'm messing around with and changing. And it might have more than one level, so it's got a, a, a plan A and a plan B. Okay. The dependent variable is the thing that you're the most interested in. So in that example, the dependent variable would be hamstring strength. Because that's the thing that I want to find out whether I can change. Right. It takes time to get used to it. And when I was first in grad school, I had to literally write this down on a, a, a card, you know, a codex card, and carry it around with me because I could never get them sorted out which way around they went. And now it seems so obvious. To me, but when I was at your stage, I was like, which one's which? I can't remember which one's which. So I literally just wrote it down and carried it in my bag. Um, so when you are looking for your purpose statement, if it's a quantitative article, then your the IV or IVs and the DV should be recognizable within that purpose statement. You should be able to read the purpose and go, okay, this is their independent variable, this is the thing of interest, okay? When you create your own purpose statement in a few weeks' time, you are looking for one dependent variable and one independent variable. I might allow you to go to two independent variables if you have a really good purpose. But the more variables you add in, the more complicated the study becomes. Right? So we want to keep it as simple as possible. Okay? When we talk more about the difference between quantitative and qualitative, research, um, if it is a qualitative paper, they A, they don't call them independent and dependent variables, and B, they don't always identify them at the beginning of the paper like that. Sometimes they change them as they go through the study. All right, so um, it's, it's slightly different with a qualitative research paper than it is with quantitative. But just keep practicing them and you'll get you'll get used to it. You'll start to be able to go, oh okay, that's the thing they're interested in, so that's the dependent. What the heck are they manipulating? Like you know, so and then you can look around and try to find what they're manipulating. Okay. Okay, so 
So let's get out of that one and pick up with what we were planning to do this week. All right. So this week I'm going to um, try to explain where you should be looking for research, what would count as good research, what is stuff you don't want to touch with a barge pole, okay? And I'm going to give you some more APA information. Um, let me know if I'm going too fast on that. I don't want to drown you with it, but I just want to add a little bit more. Last week we covered the reference, so this week I want to add a couple more pieces to that. And I'll do a quick review of the article summary breakdown. Um, some people did not submit the practice article and so this week this weekend is going to be their first try. So I want to make I just want to go over the template very quickly and the rules and things so that they've got that to work with. Okay. Alright. So, as much as possible in your graduate work, you want to use peer-reviewed literature. All right, peer-reviewed means that it's gone through when you submit the article for publication, that it gets edited and looked at and reviewed and they give feedback by people who are good at your discipline. Okay? Now, in sport admin, I would recommend that you talk to the instructor in charge of the class because if it was an exercise science or a coaching class, this is the rule and there's not a lot of getting around it. But for sports administration, it may be that they would be willing, for example, if you look in the APA reference examples, there's um, something like a, uh, a TV documentary or a TV interview or something like that. And depending on the class that you're taking, that may be an appropriate reference source for that class. But I wouldn't use it without checking with the instructor, okay? because everybody has slightly different boundaries depending on the, the content and the class that they're teaching. Some of them may want you to go and look into them, you know, if you're doing sport and the media, right, which is one of the classes, then presumably you're expected to go and look into the media and pull examples from the media, right? So, I'm not going to say don't do that, I'm just going to say always check with the instructor first because the general rule of thumb is that you should use peer-reviewed literature, preferably a good quality journal or a good quality textbook. Right. Um, then another thing to think about is as you start to read more and more, you know, it really is okay for you to read an article and go, that doesn't make sense, why did they do it like that? Why didn't they do this? Or you read the front half of the article and they're talking about variables A, B, and C, and then all of a sudden in the results and the discussion, they bring in variables D and E, but they never talked about those variables further on. Right? That's a big boo okay? But those kinds of things happen because sometimes um, an author will have more than one lot of data that they can publish from a study and they get a little lazy about rewriting the article when they submit the second lot of data and they cut and paste from the first article. Right? So sometimes you get these kinds of errors turning up where all of a sudden there's information there that was never introduced earlier in the article or something like that, okay? So, um, you know, keep your wits about you. Just because it's on paper and just because it's published doesn't mean it's necessarily correct or perfect, okay? Um, be very careful 
with any internet material that you use because they're often not validated. Um, if it's a coaching article from some, you know, even if he's a famous coach, you know, coaches have their own ideas about how to do things and they're not necessarily supported by the science, right? So, um, and blogs, you know, things like that. Again, in another, in a administration type class, it may be that they want you to be finding these kinds of references. Check with the instructor, all right? In, in the science classes, if you take theory of practice in the spring, then this kind of material would not be really acceptable unless it was very, very high quality and, and the person was very well qualified. Okay. And just a reminder, when you start thinking about what am I going to write a purpose about? Okay. I, I don't know what I want to write on. Okay. Well, just you know, look, up, look amongst the literature, find something that's interesting to you. Right? So if you don't know, right, if you're in point A and I've got no idea what I'm interested in from a research perspective, then just read anything that you come across that has a word in it that you think, ooh, that might be fun, right? If you think, oh, I want to do something on basketball, right, well that narrows the field down a little bit, okay, not a lot. If you do a search just for basketball, you'll get hundreds of thousands of hits of journal articles, right? So, um, but that narrows it down a little bit, then you can start looking at basketball articles and try to find something that you're interested to read about and learn about and then create a review on, right? It should be fun, right? This should be fun. Research is really fun if you pick the right topic, right? If you pick a topic and you get five weeks into the topic and you're like, oh my god, this is deadly. <laughs> then the rest of the semester is going to be very, very hard work. All right? So try to make sure that, you, that, the, that the initial choice of question is something that really kind of makes you go, oh god, I can't wait. It's my library hour. We can dig around in the databases and find some more information. So both your textbook, if, you, if you've done the reading for this week, it will have covered that. If you haven't, make sure you do. And the APA manual go into a lot of detail about what constitutes peer-reviewed literature and what doesn't. All right, and then how do I tell if a journal is good quality? Well, you can literally look that up on the internet nowadays. Um, but they'll give you some idea of, you know, is it, does it look like it's got a wide, if you read the blurb inside the journal, it will tell you kind of what the readership is. So if it has a tiny, tiny readership, that's probably not a very high quality journal. Okay, and then I didn't take this out, although it's actually incorrect for the article that we did as a practice, but this article may come up in the remaining articles that you have to do, so I left it there as a hint for you. Um, so when, you, when we get to a, um, if we get to a paper that's looking at, I think that might be concussion testing, KD test, is that concussion test? So, yeah. So if we have a concussion paper, there's a bit of a hint there for you. All right. So you can come back and have a look at this PowerPoint and see. I just can't remember if I've included the concussion in the list this semester. So I try to change up the articles each semester so that. Yeah. And this will be on uh, Blackboard too, right? If you don't get down. The PowerPoint? Oh yeah, okay. everything's up there. Cool. Yeah.
Okay. So, briefly then, um, the, the library has a pretty comprehensive electronic database access. All right, certainly for a reasonably small university. Um, and so you've got access to millions of articles once you know how to manipulate these databases. And Karen will teach you that next week. Right? Um, you can search by anything you want to search by, any subject. If you already have read something, and you thought it was interesting, you can put that author in and see if that author has any other papers that you might find interesting. Um, you can look, so like for me, Research Quarterly for Exercise and Sport is a big journal in my field, so sometimes I go straight to that journal and read the contents and see if there's anything I want to read, right? So if you know of a journal, um, medicine and science in sport and exercise is a good one if you're into strength and conditioning. Any of the ACSM ones are good. Um, um, there are sport management journals. I don't know. Because <laughs> right? that's outside my field. But if you want an idea of um, some good quality uh, sport admin type journals, drop Dr. Yun an email and ask him to give you some tips as to what would be good ones to look at. Um, Karen will show you, we actually have an HPE research page and that has a list of journals so um, I think he has put some journals in that list so you can, that will help you as well. And Karen, as I said, Karen will teach you about that next week. Um, Sometimes when you search for journals and you click on the PDF or the name of the article, they, it takes you to a screen that says, okay, you have to pay me $36 for 12 hours access to this paper. Don't pay any money. Do not pay money. The university has a big interlibrary loan budget and they can get you most things for free. All right? That's a big plus because when I was in grad school we had to we only had like X number of papers per semester that we could order through interlibrary loan and after that we had to pay for them. So the fact that they give you Unlimited access to interlibrary loan is a really huge benefit for you guys. Okay, don't abuse it. All right, don't order papers just because it sounds like it might be interesting. Make sure that it's something you really want to read because it's expensive. It costs a lot of money. This service. All right, what they can do is. So if you want a particular article, also, just to let you know, um, if you're on campus, we do have quite a library of old medicine and science um, research portalies and some other magazines in the lounge room there. So you can always come and try there first. Um, in the in GA44. Um, okay, you don't know it, it's a lounge. <laughs> yeah, GA44 just round the corner. Um, but they can, you know, you if you can't get to it, you can put a request in to interlibrary loan and they will do everything they can to get it for you. They're pretty quick on regular journal articles. You usually get it back within a couple of days. Don't rely on that. Right? If this is a key paper for you later in the semester, don't wait till the last minute to go and pick it up. Right? Um, if it's a Scandinavian journal, for some reason they seem to have some problems getting hold of some of the Scandinavian journals. But they don't have any problem getting hold of British journals 
or other European journals. It's just there's just something about the Scandinavian countries for some reason it seems to be a bit difficult. So initially what they'll do is they'll check all the other libraries in the state and if they can get it from one of them it's cheaper for them and they'll get it there. If they can't find it there they'll start doing a national search for you. So as I said they will track it down if they can. go into the template and change the first line from citation to reference because although as I explained last week the, the word citation is interchangeable within the APA manual citation means something different and so I was like you know what you're just confusing the issue so I went in and changed the word to reference so when you are doing your summary templates and your annotated bibliography, you're looking for the reference format, not the citation format that we're going to talk about now. Okay. Okay, so chapter six in our APA manual, all right, talks about crediting sources. Okay. So I mentioned last week that if you do not give credit to the person that had the idea or originally published the idea or the, the, that that real that ends up becoming plagiarism okay so not surprisingly APA has a very specific way of you putting in the um, credit for someone else Okay, so this is going to occur either at the beginning or in the middle of a sentence. So this is why you're actually writing, okay? And you want to say, um, research has shown that dog walking improves physical activity levels in children. Okay. You can't put a full stop and then carry on. You have to cite that. So you would have to open brackets, put the author and the year, close brackets. Okay. So the rules, like with everything else with APA, are relatively ridiculous and specific, but that's the way it is, right? It's out of my control. Um, if it is one work by one author, then depending on how you construct your sentence, if you put dog walking has been shown to, um, to improve physical activity in children, open brackets, name, comma, year, close bracket, and then you can carry on the sentence or you can begin another sentence. Or you could say, so-and-so, open bracket year, has shown that dog walking improves physical activity in children. So it just depends how you choose to structure the sentence. And when you're writing a big paper, you want to change that up every now and then, otherwise it gets very boring as the reader if you, if you construct a sentence the same way every time. Okay? So it's pretty simple if you're doing one work by one author. But if, like our dog walking paper, there's more than one author, then the rules start to get a little more tricky, right? So you have to be really careful to follow the manual, okay? So if you have only two authors, then the rule is that you cite both names every time talk about the paper. Okay? Now, I say that if you're writing a paragraph 
and you are talking about the same paper throughout the paragraph, you don't have to put the citation at the end of every sentence. Right? But if you change paragraph, or you change and you bring in some other information and then you go back to the dog walking article, then you would have to cite it again. Yes? Um, would you cite it in the beginning of the paragraph or at the end if it was like the same about the same um, it would depend, again, it would depend how I was structuring the piece of information. Um, if I was going to, say, dog walking improves physical activity in children, um, and this was verified by using actigraph accelerator, accelerometers, but it appears that the parents didn't, oh, right? then I probably wouldn't repeat it again after I put it that first time. But if I put the walking improves physical activity in children citation, this was corroborated by another study, and then I came back to the, ex the actigraph, I would cite it again when I came back to the same paper, the original paper. Am I answering your question? Um, so if it's two, you're okay, right? Cite both of them every time. If it has three, four, or five, this is where it starts to become a pain in the neck, right? If it's three, four, or five, you cite all of them the first time you cite it, and you only cite the first author followed by et al the rest of the times you cite it. If it has six or more authors, and this is where I really, this version of APA drives me bonkers, because if you're doing a reference, you've got seven authors before you have to change the format of the authors. When you're citing, now we we'll suddenly make it six. I don't know what, okay, I, who knows. So if you have six or more, then you only cite the first author followed by et al whenever you use it. Right? They're just trying to keep the, the length of the paper and the paragraph or the sentence under control, really. So again, you know, we're not going to do citations in this class because you're not going to write a paper per se in this class, right? What I would recommend is that you spend some time with your APA manual and some Cardex cards, right? And you go to page 174 and you make little notes on the Cardex card. One author do this, two authors do this, three authors do this, six authors do this. And you just sit it in your APA manual. Because the binding on this manual is pretty tight, so if you jam a little card in there, it probably won't fall out unless you're chucking your manual over it, which you might actually get so frustrated and you chuck it out the window, right? But, um, you know, if you jam a little card or a piece of paper into that binding, it probably won't fall out, and then you don't have to read all the blurb every time you need to check up on, what do I do if it's three authors? What do I do if it's eight authors? What do I do if it's one author? So this is just, this is information for your other classes really, right? You're, you're not going to use this here, but you, when you are writing your papers, you have to start citing, otherwise you are going to get dinged for plagiarism. And as I said, that's a pretty bad thing, okay? Depending on whether the instructor decides you did it on purpose or whether you did it by accident. If they think you did it on purpose, that's at least a zero for that paper, okay? So, I know it's a pain, 
I know it is not straightforward and there are all these picky, picky, silly little rules, but they're not my rules. Right? You have to follow them. Okay, punctuation, I mentioned this a little bit last week because it's another one that just is crazy. And I probably got it round the wrong way last week, so I want to make sure we cover it. So again, there are many, many punctuation rules. I've given you the pages to look at. It's, chapter, it's within chapter four. Okay. And I would really recommend that you actually read the APA stuff around the things you're looking up because they actually they have really useful information. Okay. Um, so if I'm going to do a full stop or a, a period, right, at the end of a sentence, you have to space twice. If it's within your reference that we did last week, you only space once. So depending on when you learn to type, or if you learn to type, right? When I learn to type, you double space, right? At the end of every sentence, double space, double space, double space. Then I get into grad school, and the fifth edition says you can only single space. So that took me about 10 months to change my finger from doing a double space to a single space. And now we're back in the sixth edition, they've gone back to a double space. So, all right, so space twice in between sentences, all right? within the body of the paper. But in the reference, you only space once. I have to tell you, I am not going to deduct points if you get the spacing after the period wrong in the... Uh, that's not one of the things I'm going to deduct for because I think it's a... It's ludicrous that they have two rules. And, and B, it, I just think it's, it's easy to get that wrong, right? So if you have the spacing wrong in the reference, I'm, that's not something that I'm going to be docking. I'll highlight it for you, but it's not something I would dock a mark for, okay? Um, commas, so again, depending on when you first took English in school, you may have been taught that when you do a list, right, so um, rainbows are red, orange, yellow, right? So you may have been taught that you don't use commas in a list. Now we do. So then it has to be a comma, a comma, a comma, and you used to not put a comma before and, right? You need a comma. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's true. And that's what, see this, the reason I point this out is not that you have to learn it. You have to learn there's a rule and use your damn manual. You can't learn all this. It's, it's silly, right? But you need to be aware that there's a rule so you can go and look it up and make sure you get it right. That's the point. Okay? As I said, there are things like you will get to a point where you'll be able to do a reference without looking it up most of the time because you'll do so many of them over the next two years that you'll just be able to do that, right? But stuff like this, I, I, I mean, I know this one because this is what I was taught in school because I did English before. 
before you lot were born, right? So this isn't hard for me. It was hard when I went to a class where they wanted to change it and get rid of the commas. <laughs> but you know, it's as I say, it's not a question of learning the rules, it's a question of realizing there is a rule and going and looking it up. And there's a rule for everything. Everything. Right? So just assume there's a rule, go look it up. You know. When, as I said last week, when do I, if, if, if I'm doing six minutes, how do I write six minutes, right? I can never remember, okay? Well, I can write six because it's with minutes. So I'm actually allowed to write the number six, whereas the number rules are if it's under 10, you have to write it out, right? But because it's six minutes, I'm allowed to put a number six, okay? And then I have to look it up then because I think, I could be wrong because it's a while since I looked it up, I think it's six space minute. And I could not tell you whether there's going to be a period after that end or not. I don't think so, but again, I would have to go and look it up. Right? Um, you're allowed to shorten hours to HR, but you're not allowed to shorten year to YR. You have to write year. There, there's no logic, so you can't try to learn the rule and then just apply it to everything because there is no logic. <laughs> you just have to start thumbing and putting stickies on and writing yourself notes and, and that's the only way. Spelling and hyphenation. Reading, do not abbreviate the following units of time 
even when they're accompanied by a numeric value, day, week, month, year. How you could misread those, I do not know. But you are allowed to abbreviate hour, minute, millisecond, second, nanosecond. And they give you lots of so um, centimeters or percentages or what if you have a weight right you went and they were 110 pounds how do you right it's all in here Here's how I like to work this, right? Because it's very tempting, I know, for you guys to come into my office and go, Dr. Paul, show me how to write this abbreviation. Okay? And I'm going to go, no. <laughs> go away and try it, check your APA manual, come back and I'll give you feedback on it. Right? Because if I just tell you, or I look it up for you, you're not going to learn what's in there and what isn't in there, okay? So always have a go first before you come in and ask me, or if you're gonna send me a draft of something, have a go at it first before you, beforehand, so that I can give you specific feedback and point you in the right direction, okay? Remember that if you wanna send me a draft of either your APA or of your whole article, if you can get it to me early enough, I know I didn't this week, but there was 15 deadlines Monday and Tuesday this week, so I, it was like I couldn't get anything done. Um, but Tuesday is my day for grading your papers. They're due Saturday night, so if you can get something to me Friday or even Saturday morning, I will do the best I can to get it back to you. If I get it back to you and you're like, well, now she sends it to me, it's like five o'clock and I have to start cooking dinner, right? Then email me and say, I, I can't do this now, can I have an extension until tomorrow? I'm not going to grade them on Sunday. I have to write lecture notes for an undergrad class on Monday morning, right? So Sunday is lecture note day, not grading day. So if you need an extent, the reason I had the deadline set Saturday night is I don't want you to work on Sunday, right? And we all do that. We put everything off until the last minute. And if I set the deadline for 11 o'clock on Sunday night, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock on Sunday, you're going to be working instead of relaxing and resting. Right? So the deadline is Saturday night in an attempt to make sure that you take some time off and get some before we jump in again. Doesn't mean you can't extend it if you need to. Or if you've got a game, right? And there's no way you can get it done before you go. It's not a problem. The problem is not asking. Right? If you email me Saturday and you say, oh, I couldn't do that yesterday because I'm going to say, well, you can hand it in for 50%. Because you have to be professional as well. Right? That's part of the learning curve, taking responsibility. Okay. okay, any questions on that little bit of APA stuff? As I said, it really is not something that anyone expects you to learn. Don't even waste time trying. Waste time highlighting and tabbing your book so that you can find this information quickly. Right? Okay. All right, so quick review of this article summary because as I said, some people didn't do the practice. And I just want to make sure, since the video died on me last week, that we um, just run through this. Um, so I have a template in Blackboard. Please use that template.
type into the template because that is setting boundaries of what you can and can't do. Okay? You are allowed to type two lines within one row of the table. Okay? It's a Word document. Word will allow you just to keep typing. Don't keep typing within one row. Two lines in one row. Then you drop down to the next row. Don't use the abstract. Find the information that you need within the body of the text. The abstract is already a summary of the article. Right? And sometimes, depending on their word limit, like I've done, I've done conferences where your abstract is literally 125 words. Right? I'm not writing the whole purpose statement now if I only have 125 words. I'm going to shorten it. Well, now it's not the real purpose statement. Okay? Make sure that you're using the appropriate reference format. So lots of people did not use APA reference. So make sure that you're going back, you're looking at the manual, and you're following those journal reference. So that's going to be page you're going to need for the articles I'm giving you are going to be one, two, or three. Okay? So, follow the format. Right? If you're not sure, do a draft, send it to me so I can give you some feedback on it. Okay? Remember that the authors are not alphabetized in our discipline, unlike some other formatting manuals. All right, so that list of authors from last week, and our first author was Jo Salmon, she doesn't suddenly end up at the end of the list because her surname starts with an S. She is the primary author on that paper. She stays first. Right? Keep the authors in the order they are written on the paper. Okay, there are two boxes where you are allowed to plagiarize. You can cut and paste. One is the purpose statement, one is the conclusion. So you're looking for one sentence for a purpose statement, one sentence for a conclusion, you can copy and paste. Because I don't want you trying to rewrite those at this point in your career, because if you reword it, you might change the intent of the author. Okay? So for now, you can copy and paste the purpose and the conclusion. But not any of the other stuff. The other stuff I expect you to read and then have a go at writing for yourself. Type of article, remember that was in the reading for last week. It's on page, starts on page eight, I think, in your APA manual. Right? So ask yourself the question, was there data collected? If there was data collected, what kind of data was it? Right? Was it one person or was it many people? It can't be a case study if there were 1,220 participants. A case study means you go to the hospital and you get the notes on one particular person. Is it empirical? Is there data collected? may not be empirical might be a literature review, in which case they don't, the authors don't collect data, they review other people's data. Okay. 
design method, that element is the plan for data collection. So I've got the question, this is what I want to find out. Next step, if it's a quantitative paper, the next step is how am I going to collect that data in a way that is going to answer my question? Okay. So if I go, if I go back to my strength, my hamstring strength, right? If I'm going to work out whether or not the hamstring has got stronger, what do I have to do? I'm going to have to test. How many times am I going to have to test? How do I know if their hamstring has got stronger? Do I test after I've done the strength program? Yes. Well, I'll say before example. There you go, right? Because I have to have a baseline and then I have to have an outcome. And then I compare the two. Right? So it may be a pre, post, or repeated measures design. Right? Or our design for last week for the practice was a questionnaire based design and that they actually gave you a clue in, in one of the sentences about the more complicated version. But really what I was looking for was the questionnaire based. Right? They just sent out a questionnaire and that's how they gathered the data to answer their question. That's probably the trickiest box on the template, to be honest. Right? Takes a lot of practice, reading research to get that one. So, you know, give it a go. Don't get to point five of a mark. You'll live if you don't get it, right? As long as the rest of the stuff is good. Okay? So give it a go, but don't don't spend three hours stressing out over the design. <laughs> because that is that's a pretty big link. Okay. Participants. So we're looking for the characteristics that made them suitable for the study. I have to know how many of them there were. Right? Typically, although not always, but typically. I'm going to want to know what age they were. Okay, on, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading my notes, you said you don't put the age in brackets. Yes. So, I don't, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the APA, they, they, they don't have you put the age in brackets. So, you would just put um, 50 children aged 5 to 10 years and 100 children aged X to Y years. Yeah. So just don't put it, you put it within the sentence rather than within the brackets. What are those called? That word. I couldn't remember the word when I was typing your, your <laughs> and Brian wasn't around for me to laugh. Oh crap, what's that word? So I put brackets. Um, so usually you, you, well, you always need the number. Typically, you need the age. Um, then you're looking for characteristics that make them relevant for the study. And you've got to go back to your purpose statement. Remember that in, this, in the study for the practice, in the purpose statement, we were looking at children and parents. We weren't looking at girls and boys or mothers and fathers. So whilst that information was available, it's not key for a summary, right? Because it isn't directly part of the initial question. It's the next layer down. And when we're writing a summary, we're trying to keep it key highlights, right? So the procedures then is that how did they collect the data, 
right? What did they actually do? Step by step by step by step. Again, pick the steps that are relevant to the purpose because they might have done something in 